do you think we can trace a line from Northern Rock over to the, if you like, the popular insurgency in British politics and the developments, parallel developments in other countries, including the one you're sitting in? Up to a point. Uh, the financial crisis was indeed the key event, and I think you can draw a line from the financial crisis to the recent voting patterns around the industrialised world. But I don't think you can put it on Northern Rock, because even if Northern Rock hadn't even existed and hadn't failed, we would still have had a global financial crisis in 2008. Fair point. Um, one of the things that I think made the public extremely angry, and has, uh, that anger is still present, is the sense that a lot of bankers got away with it. Now, I know you're not a believer in sending bankers to jail, but it does stick in the throat, doesn't it, that so many people made money from activity that was obviously socially useless, and they kept the money, even though when it became obvious that they'd damaged the institutions they were working for. Was there anything we could have done about that? I don't think after the event it was easy. I mean, some bankers have indeed gone to jail for individual criminal acts. And I think it's quite difficult just to tear up private contracts that are valid in law. But I think the crucial thing is just to investigate very carefully what happened, reflect on it, and make sure that we create a system now that won't fail in a way that the whole system failed in 2007-8. Is that not just a little bit, a little bit limp as a reaction? You know, Dick Fould, the, the chief executive of Lehman Brothers, took home something like half a billion dollars in the decade before the bank that he was running ran into the ground. Half a billion dollars. I mean, that is sort of serious money. And standing behind the line that, well, we have to, the law of contract, we have to respect that, there's nothing we can do. I just, I just wonder whether that doesn't explain why people are just so mad. Well, I think the right lesson from that is to make sure that such contracts cannot be written in future. And I know the regulators in the United Kingdom, the Financial Conduct Authority, are taking serious steps to ensure that bankers can be held personally responsible for what happens and that will then feed through to the ability to take money out of the bank. But I think to say you just tear up contracts retrospectively is not a sensible way on which to base a market economy. We'll all lose in the future on that basis. But those things were clearly wrong and it's up to the individual regulators to do what they can. They need to be given powers to prevent that kind of thing happening and they weren't given those powers before the crisis. But you, you, you understand the public's anger at those kinds of cases, the Fred Goodwin pension and, the, uh, and Dick Fuld's salary. I mean, you understand why people, a decade after, say, I have suffered for a decade, I haven't had a pay rise, I as a taxpayer helped bail out these institutions, and these people walked off richer than any of us could ever dream of being. I, I, th I fully understand the anger, I share it. I think it is justified, and as you yourself said just now, I'm surprised the anger has not been greater during the period since the crisis. But it's not just one or two individuals. It's a mistake to focus on that. The entire banking system was bailed out. And what I want to do, and I put forward proposals for this, is to ensure that banks have to pay a, an insurance premium every year when there isn't a crisis in order to give them access to a credit line from the central bank when there is a crisis so that people will, will feel that they've paid for it in advance and they are then entitled to borrow from the central bank. After all, the, the real basis for anger, I think, is not just the individuals. It's that everyone was told in the 20, 25 years before the crisis that if we accepted the discipline of a market economy and accepted that we might lose our jobs, that our small businesses might disappear and the government wouldn't intervene, that was the way to have a healthy market economy with rising living standards. And the people who were at the forefront of conveying that message was in, were in the financial sector. When they got into financial trouble, what happened? We all bailed them out. And I think that's the real source of the anger. And we need to put in place a system where that will not happen in future. Were you one of those people who was telling the public, we've got this system, a market economy, it works, it's brutal sometimes, but it works? Because people might feel some anger at, you know, not just the bankers, but the people in charge of the system, such as yourself, or Alistair Darling, who we had on the programme the other day. No, I, but they may well feel that. All I can do is to point to what we said and did at the time and what I've been arguing very forcefully for in, from the day that Northern Rock failed 
and I went before the Treasury Committee. Until today, I put forward similar proposals for making sure that we never have to go through this again. Mm. And we've implemented some of them, but not all of them. Michael Gove famously said we've had enough of experts. Was it not the financial crash that I think made many people think we've had enough of experts? People who just didn't see it coming and didn't particularly, when it did come, didn't handle it uh, in particularly grand style? No, I think the concern about experts doesn't date back to the financial crisis because there were serious and, and, and very important debates immediately after the crisis as to how we should reform our banking system. And a great deal of very good legislation was put in place. I think the concern about experts during the uh, referendum on membership of the European Union had much more to do with the nature of the campaign that both sides ran which frankly treated the public with a good deal of disdain and as if they were rather stupid. We didn't get the quality of arguments in the European Union referendum campaign that we did actually have about the future of banking after the financial crisis. One of the consequences, as we've been saying, of, of, of the financial crash is the, the, the rise of populist forces on the left and the right. Do you see anything out of, say, Let's take the left, just because it's much, much bigger in this country. Jeremy Corbyn and his economics. Do you see anything in that that will address, if you like, constructively address the anger and annoyance of the public of what happened a decade ago? No, I think the problems are very much deeper. And I'm not sure that any one country will find it easy to find a route out of the problems that we face. I think we'll need more international cooperation. But the problems go back before the financial crisis to the uh, enormous influx of people working in manufacturing around the world, to the enormous amount of savings that were placed in the world economy, to the reduction of interest rates, which was the main factor pushing up the prices of houses and assets of all kinds, which led to the expansion of the banking system and its ultimate collapse. So I think these are deeper factors, and I, I don't think uh, any one country will find a simple solution and I don't think that the solutions that we've seen are actually likely to bring about a resolution of these problems. Mm. The Brexit, you've been, you've taken a fairly uh, positive view, warmer view towards Brexit than, than I think most economists have. How do you think the government's negotiating looks like it's going because you were one of those who said we can cope with a hard brexit that was more or less the sort of government line how how does it look like it's going to you now well what i actually said was that in the long run i didn't think the economic consequences would be very different if we left than if we stayed in in just the same way as i don't think that joining transformed the british economy uh, i also said that if you're going to enter a negotiation it's actually very important to make sure that the other side of the table knows that you have a fallback position that you're capable of delivering. That requires you to make clear publicly what the fallback position is. We've been waiting for over a year now, and I must say that I'm not terribly impressed by how much of that fallback position has actually been stated, been implemented, and whether it's actually being managed properly within the civil service and the government. I don't think this is a statement about the potential uh, impact of Brexit, but I don't think that the negotiations are going in the way that we might hope. And I think that you need a separate team who are responsible for ensuring that if the negotiations do break down in some way, and we cannot control that, that depends on the other side, we have no influence over that, then what we are capable of doing is saying, well, if you don't want an agreement, then we are capable of leaving and trading with you, for example, under WTO terms. Lord, it's not you... our first preference, but we can do, we can do it. And we Lord need King. a team of people who are capable of delivering that. Lord King, thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you, Evan.